morning, church family. It's great to see you this Sunday morning. Uh, what a sweet season it's been just to have some uh, friends and family around. I've seen a lot of faces lately that it's really warmed my heart to see you and reunite again. So very grateful for that. We have an opportunity to join together in worship this morning. Amen. Amen. So before we do that, I do have some brief announcements. There is uh, a factor within the church called Body Life. Are you down for Body Life? I'm down for Body Three of you are down for Body Life. For <laughs> Going into the new year, we're, we're crashing and burning on the last day. Now, excited for some things coming up. Uh, getting back to the regular schedule here this, this coming week. Um, so Wednesday night, we do have our supper happening. Uh, TAG for children will begin this Wednesday night. We're actually going to do an orientation for TAG. Uh, that'll be new this year, so uh, we'll have fun joining together for that. I'm going to give a little uh, biblical encouragement for why we do TAG with our children. So uh, kids be here for that. Uh, youth, we're back up and running this Wednesday night in small groups. And then regular midweek worship will begin uh, again as, long, uh, sorry, as well as all other rehearsals for choir, etc. Bible fellowships uh, begin again next Sunday at 9 o'clock. Be here for that. Don't miss out on the opportunity to fellowship with others. Uh, a senior adult Bible study begins this Thursday, uh, 10 a.m. in the fellowship hall. And it runs for eight consecutive Thursdays, the topic is finishing well, and it's an in-depth in -depth look at the ministry of the Holy Spirit. It's led by retired pastor Dwight Brown. Go Browns. Can't, just got to keep, while they're winning, I got to keep saying it. Uh, all ages are welcome to that Bible study, so feel free to join. Also ahead, uh, Christ Bible College is uh, going to begin again on the week of January 8th, and there are details for that with, uh, inside the bulletin. We do have a really uh, special baptism service coming up on a Wednesday night. It's Wednesday, January 10th during regular worship. We've got several being baptized that evening, so mark that on your calendar. Two weeks from today, uh, youth, the final payment for Youth Winter Retreat, and the retreat itself is going to take place January 26th through the 28th at Lake Aurora Christian Camp in Lake Wales, Florida. And then three weeks from today, We've got two big events. We've got a membership class for any prospective members. There's also a movie night, and the details for that are in your bulletin as well. Before we begin our, begin our worship this morning, I do want to turn our heads towards Scripture as we consider our relationship with Christ. To begin a brand new year knowing about our new birth in Jesus is a great encouraging thing, is it not? Let's consider what he says in John 15. Verses 4 and 5 and 9 and 10. Jesus says, Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine. So neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him, he bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Verse 9, just as the Father has loved me, I have also loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. As we wrap up 2023, help us to remember who is first and preeminent in our lives. Thank you for the new birth that we have through your finished work on the cross. Such great reminders over this season of your incarnation. You humbly came to us in the form of sinful man that you would bear the, the burden and the penalty of our sin, Lord. Thank you for accomplishing that on our behalf and doing something that we could not do and living in a way that's pleasing to God the Father. Lord, thank you for the provision of grace that we have through your gospel. Lord, lead us in worship. Render our hearts unto you as we sing your praises and attend our ears and our eyes to your word. Work in our hearts, Lord, to love you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, Aaron. What a great reminder, church, that in every circumstance, everything that happens, especially this past year, God is working through everything. Amen? amen. So to that end, why don't you stand your feet and let's worship the Lord together.
us worship our King. Come, let us bow at His feet. Oh, He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. Oh, He has done great things. Yes, He has. He has done great things. Savior, your name lifted high, oh God, you have done great things. You've been faithful through every storm, you'll be faithful forever. I know you will do it again, for your promise is yes and amen. Oh, you will do great things. God, you do great things. Redeemer, Redeemer from heaven, you conquer the grave. You free every captive and break every chain.
church where the spirit leads as I'm following oh I depend on you yes I Life of trials test my faith. I set my hope on Jesus. When the questions come and doubts remain, I set my hope on Jesus. For the deepest wounds that time won't heal, there's a joy that runs still deeper. There's a truth that's more than all I feel. I set my hope on Jesus. I set my hope on Jesus, my rock, my only trust, who set his heart upon me first. I set my hope on Jesus.
Our hope is in Jesus. Amen? Amen. Well, our scripture reading for today comes from the 39th chapter of the book of Psalms. I said, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth as with a muzzle while the wicked are in my presence. I was mute and silent. I refrained even from good and my sorrow grew worse. My heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. Lord, Make me to know my end. And what is the extent of my days? Let me know how transient I am. Behold, you have made my days as handbreadths, and my lifetime as nothing in your sight. Surely every man at his best is a mere breath. Selah. Surely every man walks about as a phantom. Surely they make an uproar for nothing. He amasses riches and does not know who will gather them. And now, Lord, for what do I wait? My hope is in you. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish. I have become mute. I do not open my mouth because it is you who have done it. Remove your plague from me because of the oppression, opposition of your hand I am perishing. With reproofs you chasten a man for iniquity. You consume as a moth what is precious to him. Surely every man is a mere breath. Selah. Hear my prayer, O Lord, and give ear to my cry. Do not be silent at my tears, for I am a stranger with you, a sojourner like all my fathers. Turn your gaze away from me, that I may smile again before I depart and am no more. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Well, it's the last day of the year. And on behalf of the elders, we want to thank you for your generosity in giving all the way throughout the year. Your generosity shows how much you trust in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You don't trust in kings or rulers or economies. Your trust is in the Lord. We have one more day left, so we would ask you to continue your generosity. If you're joining with us online, we want to thank you for being with us. If this ministry has blessed you, we would ask that you would consider being generous and giving with the instructions that are on your screen. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty God, you have shown the new light of your incarnate word to us. And as that light shines in our hearts, Lord, I pray that it would shine forth in our life. And what we think, what we say, what we do. We ask, Lord, that you would use us as tools and instruments. But in doing so, help us to wait expectantly. I'm reminded of Anna and Simeon in scripture, who were in the temple waiting for the coming of the Messiah. 
Help us to follow their example and wait patiently and expectingly for the second coming of the Messiah, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, so that you would be glorified through us. In his name we pray. Amen. Good morning, church. Wow, it's a little fuller than I expected today. Uh, this is usually one of the probably lowest attendance services, but look at all you out. 
Praise the Lord for you. I'm encouraged by you. I know there's many online. Some of you are on the road. You keep your eyes on the road, but keep listening. Um, it's good to be with you today, and it is the last day of the year, as um, several have mentioned already, and I want to encourage you greatly today. We're going to be in Psalms 39 today, and really focusing on the brevity of life as we enter 2024. I want to prick your heart and mind through the Word of God to think about what we're going to do with our lives. They may not be long. We don't know what the Lord is going to give each one of us, so that'll be the goal today. So much of the music that was selected today, um, will you, as you will see, will just tie completely into the passage of Scripture as we work our way through this. Let's pray and ask the Lord to help us. Father, we are so grateful for your love. You are the God of grace. We would not know grace without you. Not, not saving grace and truly heavenly grace. We would not know that. But you demonstrated that while we were yet sinners, you sent your son. And we know grace. And so we thank you that you are the God of grace as we end this year. We thank you for the grace that you bestowed on us, Lord. Even in hardships, you were there graciously caring for us. And Lord, we know that you will not abandon your own. We are your children. And you will walk with us through 2024. And how many days you give each one of us, you've ordained, but we know your grace will be with us. And Lord, now as we look to your word, may you stimulate our hearts and minds to think deeply about this short life we live here, certainly in comparison to eternity. And may this put a charge in our hearts, Lord, to live for you and run hard for you in 2024, Lord. May we not sit on the sidelines. May we run together as a team, a group of people called Riverbend Church who is dedicated and burning white hot for your glory, Lord. Lord, as I pray, you put a charge in us today, Lord. Thank you for those that are with us, so encouraged by so many faces here this morning. Be with those who can't. Lord, I pray for several that are in the hospital right now, Lord. I pray you would show your mercy on them. And I pray for others who are traveling. Keep them safe, Lord. Bring them back to us. Lord, thank you for our missionaries. Bless them now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, why Psalms 39? <laughs> well, entitled the sermon, as you see, they're living in the light of eternity. And when you get into Psalms 39, I want it to prick our hearts of this coming year, to kind of think and ponder on the brevity of life. It is very short. And I want you to think about what you're going to do the rest of your days for Jesus. What will you give him? Leftovers? Or will you give him everything? That's what we want, right? That's our, our desire, but I've told many young persons through the years, wanting and doing are very far apart. Wanting and doing can be very, very far apart. It is the heart that controls us, and whatever comes out of our heart will come out of our mouth and out of our actions. And so I want to ponder this psalm today. Many consider this psalm a messianic psalm, this in 39 and 40. Um, and you can see that. You could see Christ in his humanity feeling the weight and the judgment of God upon him as he suffered on the cross. Certainly that is true of these. And yet I want to look at the very real human suffering here that David is experiencing. David is currently going through some kind of suffering he is ill in chapter 38 to 39. He's pondering his life and how it's so short and could end at any time. And this is inspired by the Holy Spirit and he releases out these truths and they are great benefits for us as we look at this. It's clear as you study this text that David is very concerned with the shortness of life in this psalm. But in the psalm, he'll remind us that our hope is not in this world. And if your hope is in this world, friend, you are in great trouble. It will fail you and rob you, cheat you, and leave you dead. That's what this world does, but David knows better. He knows that hope is in his God as his Savior. And he will turn to him even in some of the most difficult times. I think David here, through the inspiration of the Spirit, teaches us many things and one to bring our concerns to God 
we share our concerns with one another, and that's good. We, we should do that. You should have somebody that you can share your concerns in. But ultimately, brother and sister, sister, if you're a believer, you better share your concerns with God. And I think David does that so well here. And in it, he's reminded that he is made for eternity, not made for this world. We must understand that. God has saved you and designed you in his image to live eternally with him. And yet the world has such strong pulls on us. You'll see David will be comforted with the understanding where his true security lies. Psalms 39 will, I think, change our thinking. And I think, I hope, it's really attacked my thinking of the brevity of life this week. And it's been a refreshing to think that I will not live much longer. <laughs> I will turn that golden age of 60 this year. And if the scriptures are right, that man has three score in 10 years, that's 70, 80, and we'll see this passage shortly, if God so wills, I'm in the last section. And I am going to run hard. I'm looking for a group of people who want to run with me. This is what this psalm is about. Are you going to finish well or will you retire early in your spiritual life? There's a great trifecta that defends against this, so I call it the great trifecta, the world, Satan, and our flesh. They do not want you to finish well. The world hates the things of God. The world is its own God. It wants to be the God. Satan, of course, is the ruler of this world. He's the, the father of the sons of this world, the scripture tells us. And your flesh just loves to follow itself. Those three things, this great trivecta, always are discouraging you. They're in cahoots to distract you from thinking deeply about the brevity of life and what you're going to do with what God has given you. They pull our hearts and minds to get lost in things that have no eternal value, really. That's what they do. Pull you away to mundane things, to menial things, to things that don't have deep roots in who God is and what he, his purpose of creating us and saving us and redeeming us and all of that. They, they want to pull you away from that. Oh, brothers and sisters, be careful of that great trifecta, the world, Satan, and flesh. Soon, the Lord is coming back. And I think he'll ask us, what did you do with the gifts I gave you? We see that in the scriptures, right? He gives, Jesus gives us a parable of a uh, man who gives talents to them. Some double and triple it and do great things with it, and others just bury it in the sand. They did nothing with it. They lived in fear. And the Lord takes from them and gives to those who are good stewards of what he gave them. So this psalm is meant to come face to face and encounter you with the way you think about this life. And I think it's a good way to finish this, this year. Now, some theologians have looked at this psalm and said that it probably shouldn't have been divided. We see some psalms like that. I think 38 and 39 possibly were together. Remember, chapters and uh, numbers and verse numbers were, were not there. We put those so you could find your way around. I could say, turn to Psalm 39, you could find it. And, and there are some possible ones that maybe shouldn't have been divided. And this, and this maybe could be one. But if we look at Psalms 38, Psalm 38 is David, and he seems to be suffering from possibly a life-threatening illness. And remember, in the ancient world, you could have a rusty nail and you're in a lot of trouble. So he's suffering from something. We don't know what it is. But it sure makes sense when you look at 39, because after he's suffering from this life-threatening illness, he turns in Psalms 39 to ponder this brevity of life and the vanities of this life. And though we don't know what period of life this was for David, um, we do see the connection in many verses. Uh, suffering in, in possible discipline is in both these uh, chapters. Look at chapter 38, this one through three. O Lord, rebuke me not in your wrath and chasten me not in your burning anger for your arrows have sunk deep into me. Your hand has pressed down on me. 
There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. There is no health in my bones because of my sin. He is definitely being very transparent, as much like his transparency in Psalms 32 and 51. But in chapter 39, 10, and 11, he says similar things. Remove your plague from me because of the opposition of your hand, I am perishing. With reproofs of your chastening, a man of iniquity, you consume as a moth what is precious to him. Surely every man is a mere breath. There's this idea of silence before the Lord in both these psalms. And even silence before the wicked. Look at chapter 38, 13 through 14. But I, like a deaf man, do not hear. I am like a mute man who does not, have, does not open his mouth. Yes, I am like a man who does not hear and in whose mouth are no arguments. Of course, chapter 39, 1 and 2, it says, I said, I will guard my mouth and I will not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth as with a muzzle. While the wicked are in my presence, I was mute and silent, refrained from, even from good, and my sorrow grew worse. And yet then there's hope within both of them. Look at 38, 15. For I hope in you, O Lord. You will answer, O Lord my God. Then verse 7, of course, in chapter 39. And now, Lord, for what do I wait? He asks this great question. We'll get into that in a minute. My hope is in you. He shows other concerns with the wicked and the reputation of God in both of these. There's, a, there's an attentiveness to, to desiring God to hear him. You see that in both of these psalms. He desires that God is attentive to him, that he is watching over him. He knows who God is. He knows his attributes, and you see those come out within this psalm. There's one more real interesting as far as introduction to this and you may not have heard this man's name, but you'll see in the inner ju- ju- uh, introduction to this, you see uh, Jadunath, Jad- uh, I practice his name, J- Jadunath, J- Jadunath. <laughs> oh, I'll get it here. No, I've got to see it in my head. Jadunathan, Jadunathan. He was one of the choir directors of Israel. He, we would find him probably hanging around Asaph as well. It's interesting that he's mentioned here, and, and I thought about this and tried to put this together, so I looked up every time he's mentioned in the Bible, he's mentioned 14 times, he's always connected with worship, particularly the choirs that would have sang in the temple. And I believe that possibly David is writing this, um, and he's writing this, notice, for the choir director. He's, he's giving this to him and possibly men like Asap, and he wants these type of psalms converted into songs so that they will sing them and they'll remember the truths. I think we did that today. I, I love singing with this church. I really enjoy hearing your voices behind me. But I love that we have a worship leader who is very concerned about what we sing. And those things are examined, and we think, and as I, as I sing, see those words on there, I don't know about you, but my mind floods with scriptures. It was interesting, and Aaron opened it up with Ephesians, I mean, excuse me, John 15, and we sang about abiding in the Lord. And, and pretty soon your mind is connecting those passages of scripture, and that's what good music should do, and I think that's what David's doing here. He says, listen, worship leaders, convert these songs to, to convert these psalms to songs so that they'll take place in the heart and mind within us and we'll sing these things together. So there's a little introduction and maybe background to this psalm, but let's look at four thoughts as we break this psalm down and certainly apply the truth to our own hearts and minds. Number one, communicate with God, but guard your tongue for his glory. Communicate with God, but Guard your tongue for his glory. Look at the first three verses. I said I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth as with a muzzle while the wicked are in my presence. I was mute and silent. I refrained even from good. And my sorrow grew worse. My heart was hot within me while I was musing the fire burned. Then I spoke with my tongue. Well, Though we are fallen, we're made in the image of God. Do you know that? And one of the aspects of being made in the image of God is God is a communicator and he made us communicate. We are not like the animals. We are made in the image of God. We are, 
we are the highest of his creation. And one of the aspects of being made as image is we communicate and God wants us to communicate. David is doing his best at this point to keep quiet. He is struggling not to communicate what's troubling him. He's holding his tongue and I think that's a good thing. You'll notice in these verses he's striving to guard his ways, his tongue, and his mouth. Now I think there's some reasons for this. First and foremost, he does not want to sin against God. So he is guarding his tongue so he does not sin against God. Oh, how often we probably sin against God with our tongue. We gossip. We get frustrated and let things out of our mouth that we should not. How often we sin against God. And David is striving here that, to keep his tongue silent so he will not sin against God. Second, notice he does not want to give his enemies reasons to doubt the living God or attack David's trust in him. He said, while the wicked are in my presence, I'll guard my mouth while the wicked are in my presence. See, David knew his words would be misused and misunderstood. There's always somebody waiting to criticize you to cause doubt of what you're saying or what you believe. They, they love to complain against this providential God that you put your hope in. And, and then when you open your mouth and you say things that are contrary to the word of God or I say things that are contrary to the word of God, our enemies wait to say, oh, they don't really trust in God. See, David senses that. And he wants to communicate with God, but oh, he wants to guard that tongue for his glory and so he refuses to let them hear the struggle that he is going through. But ultimately, David does release his concerns and his concerns about the brevity of life and the vanity that is in this life. David is striving um, to remain silent. Even, even says, even in the good things, I'm not going to talk. Even as the sorrow grows, you see that in that first few verses. But I love this part of it. You'll notice that in verse 3, my heart was hot within me. While I was musing, the fire burned, and then I spoke with my tongue, and eventually he cannot contain the fire that burns within his heart and his tongue. Verse 4, his concerns to the Lord, and I think that's so important. I have studied David most of my ministry life because one of the things I appreciate about him is he speaks things to God that sometimes Christians are afraid to say. But he does it in a way that is not sinful. You will see him, oh God, why do the wicked prosper? That's not right, God. But he's able to speak those things with a right view of God and understanding who he is. And that's what's behind these kind of statements. And yet as he comes forth, as we'll see in the rest of this psalm, most of this is about the brevity of life and the vanities and the discipline he's under the sin he has been struggling with, he's very open and honest as he opens his mouth and lets out that burn, burning desire within his heart to his God. I think there's some great reminders here as we look at this and we think about some application. One, we can sin with our tongues. It's probably the most, it's probably the biggest problem in the church. It's probably, that's probably what it is our tongues. James, you know this verse, these verses, chapter 3, verses 5 through 10, so also the tongue is a small part of the body, and yet it boasts of great things. See how great a forest fire sets aflame by such a small fire, spark to start the whole forest fire. The tongue is a fire, listen to this, the very world of iniquity. What a statement. The very world of iniquity the tongue is set among our members as, which, as that which defies the entire body and sets on fire the course of our life, and it is set on fire by hell. We haven't read that for a little while, have we? What a statement. It goes on, verse 7, James chapter 3. For every species of beasts and birds, of reptiles and creatures of the sea is tamed and has been tamed by human race. But no one can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil and full of deadly poison. With it we bless our Lord and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the likeness of God. 
from the same mouth comes both blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not to be this way. Wow. First century, possibly the first New Testament letter ever written. Guess what they're struggling with? Tongue. There's another thought as I thought about this. Number two is that there is a time of waiting on the Lord. There's a time to be silent. I think there's also a time not to give the wicked fuel for their fire, but to trust the Lord that he will set the record straight. That's hard for us, isn't it? It's frustrating when we see people doing things that they should not be doing. And and we want to be quick to speak and say, oh, that's wrong, and here's what you should do, and you should be doing this, and you should be doing that, and so forth. I think there's great wisdom in this. David said, I will guard my ways that I may not sin with my tongue. I will guard my mouth as with a muzzle. Anybody ever tell you to muzzle it? Maybe we should tell ourselves that. Time to muzzle it. Proverbs eleven twelve says this, he who despises his neighbor lacks sense, but a man of understanding keeps what? Silent. 1 Corinthians, if you're worried about the world and others getting away with things, 1 Corinthians 4 or 5 says this, therefore do not, go on, do not go on passing judgment before the time, but wait until the Lord comes who will both bring to light the hidden things in the darkness and disclose the motives of, men, of men's hearts and each man's praise will come to him from God. Wait. Keep silent. That's a trust in God, to keep our mouth shut. Even maybe when we're right in an area, having the wisdom and the responding to the spirit of God, the truth of the, God's word to say, I will not speak here. Certainly there's times to speak up and then there's times to shut up. The spirit will lead you, truth of scriptures will lead you. One more just application in this first point. There's time to keep silent before the Lord for only so long. But then there's a time to speak to him. And I think that's what David does. He is silent before the Lord, but then he cannot hold it. Verse 3, he starts to burn white hot inside, and now it's time to speak to the Lord. Do you struggle with anxiety? Stop talking to everybody else and start talking to God. It's one of the biggest problems. We struggle with anxiety and we turn to the world, but God is your God who listens to you. Paul reminds us in Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7, be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your quest be known, made known to God. And the peace of God, that's what you're after, right? That's where anxiety problems come. You want peace, the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and mind in Christ Jesus. Yes, there's a time to be quiet and just listen to God, but then there's a time to talk to him. Stop talking to everybody else. Talk to him. Certainly, let me say this, brothers and sisters, you need sweet, godly relationships that you can speak with and pray with. But too often, that becomes the dominant conversation, and the conversation with God is either non-existent or very little. And listen, I know my Bible and I would love to counsel you and help you, but I'm not God. I will point you to what he says and I'll ask you to talk to him because he has those answers. Second thought, strive to gain a biblical perspective of human existence. Strive to gain a biblical perspective of human existence. Now remember, we're trying to go into this new year and uh, honor God more with our lives and live for him. And so this is really why I'm writing this sermon and these outlines this way coming from this text. Look at verses 4 through 6. Now, Lord, make me know my end. What is the extent of my days? Let me know how transient I am. Behold, you have made my days as a hand breath, my lifetime as nothing in your sight. Surely every man at his best is a mere breath. Surely every man walks about as a phantom. 
Surely they make an uproar for nothing. He amasses riches and does not know who will gather them. Now the problem that finally bursts forth from David's tongue here is concern with this brevity of life, the vanity of the things of this world that are plaguing human existence. That's what's now coming out of him. He, and this should be our concern as well, Christian, right? There's this dominant Hebrew word in this little section. Habel is the, the Hebrew word here. Habel is it. It is often translated vanities or emptiness. Um, it's translated, you'll see it in this verse, at least in the uh, New American Standard, verse 5, it's translated as breath. Verse 6, it's translated as nothing. And then if you drop all the way down to verse 11, it's translated again as breath. And you say, well, how do you know this is speaking of vanities? Because it's the same word in Ecclesiastes 1, 2. It's used five times in that. Vanity of vanity, says the preachers. Vanity of vanity, all is vanity. Habel of Habel, says the preacher. Habel of Habels, all is Habel. Not hard to do your work on this. <laughs> you find a little word study takes you right to this. And I believe what David is saying here is not only is life short, verse Verses tell us here, three score and ten and possibly 80 years, but so is the things that mankind pursues. That's what he's trying to tell us. We strive hard to lay hold of all kinds of things that will not go into eternity with us. And in regard, they become like a breath. They, they become something that does not last. Materialism. What's going to happen to the things that you have? How hard do we pursue materialism? And believe me, this is not a sermon if God bless you. I'm not after that. I'm after what we worship. I think that's what the psalm is about. David certainly had great possessions, most likely by this time. But he knew they were not of any earthly good. I got thinking about several things. I thought about just earthly emotions. Sometimes we pursue our earthly emotions so, so vividly or so um, greatly that they become so confusing. I've watched young people pursue love so hard that they lost their way. They became uncontent to wait on the Lord. I've watched people pursue wealth and it robbed them of so much. I've watched people pursue applause and ability to be somebody and all that fade away with one injury or something else comes along. See, what are we pursuing? What belongs to this earth and what belongs to eternity Things of the earth are going to burn. Somebody else will have them. What are we chasing? And I think we can spend our entire life chasing earthly dreams and have no eternal value. And in the next moment, they're gone and this life is done. Brothers and sisters, we are a drop in the bucket of life. We are a blink of an eye compared to eternity. Eventually, we have to think about these things. I, I think James, I'm going to go back to James chapter 4 here and just read you something. But the more I looked at James this week, the more I said, man, is he, and I don't think I've seen it as well as I've seen it this week, as he was so acquainted with the wisdom books. Because I, I see him tying back, certainly these are the books he would have had to study. The New Testament wasn't written, right? He would have been studying these to write these letters. And so in James 4, listen to the effects of the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. Chapter 4, verse 13 and following, Come now, you who say tomorrow, today or tomorrow we will go to such, a, such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just like a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. I remember years ago when I was single, very broke, running my car down to no gas. And I remember going to the gas station and opening it and go, <laughs> this little vapor would come out. I, I remember where I was, where the Lord put this verse in my mind, and I say, that's you, Scott. 
just that little vapor that escaped. That's all your life is in this world. It is a vapor. One moment it's there, and the next moment it's gone. James goes on to say, instead you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we live and we do as this or that. But as it is, your boast in your arrogance, all such boasting is evil. Therefore, the one who knows what is right to do and does not do it to him it is sin. All centered around the brevity of life. Now notice at the end of verse 5, look what he does in verse 11. Both of these verses end with the word breath, followed by selah. I'm so glad Pastor Brian read that today. That is in the original. Surely every man at his best is a mere breath, selah. At the end of verse 11, surely every man is a mere breath, selah. Well, that Hebrew word means to pause and consider. You should read that when you read the Psalms when it's there. Pause and consider that this is just a breath compared to eternity. Ponder and consider the brevity of life. Ponder ponder and consider the vanity of things that we hold so tightly. There's a lot of wisdom here. And as David confronts these same issues in his life, bravery and vanity, he's confronting these things. He does it in a much different way than most people. Notice that David unburns himself to God. He's seeking wisdom versus his own. Look at verse four. Lord, make me know my end. Oh, you ready to say that to God? Oh God, I need this, I need that, I need this. Oh, help my children, this and this. We're, we're so in the moment, aren't we? David says, help me know my end. And what is the extent of my days? Let me know how transient I am. What a statement. Instead of complaining about the shortness and the unfairness of his life, I'm suffering, I have this illness, I may die. David desires of God to make known to him, help me understand the brevity and the uncertainty of this human life. Help me take this suffering and have purpose in it and direction in it so I don't just act like the rest of the world. Piper wrote a great book called Don't Waste Your Cancer. I know that's hard for some of you who are going through it and I'm sorrows over some of the illnesses that are in our church. But every one of us have issues that we should not waste God is trying to teach us through these things. So David has this right perspective of human existence and he wants to understand it and he's engaging with God to know it. Think about Moses after all the years of shepherding a very stubborn group of people called the Israelites. He's learned so many lessons and, and if you're coming on um, Wednesday nights, I did the introduction before Christmas to Deuteronomy, and I'm starting that this Wednesday, and it's just the sermons of Moses, the wisdom that God had given him. Uh, I can't wait to preach them and join them. But he also wrote Psalms 90. And in Psalms 90, and I've been referring to this a couple times, verse 10 says this, as for the days of our life, they they contain 70 years. If you have your old King James with you, it says three score and 10. Or if due to strength, where God strengthens you, 80 years. Now that puts us right in the middle of American life is at 75 years. Yet their pride is but labor and sorrow. (laughs) Are you getting this? Psalms 90 is telling us that this life is about labor and sorrow. You say, well, it doesn't sound very fun. Well, in the midst of it all, God gives us all kinds of things, right? He's so gracious. He gives us life and marriage and children and grandchildren. And he causes us to have joy and vacations and all kinds of things. He's such a good God. But we, instead of understanding all of that works together for him and worship him for those things, that becomes our consuming nature. We're consumed with our children. They become little gods. We're consumed with our vacations and our bank accounts and so forth. And we take the graciousness of God, but God's reminding us here, we only have these 70 years, maybe 80 years, and yet the pride is the labor and sorrow that's in them. For soon it is gone and they will fly away, verse 10 says. Verse 11, who's understanding the power of your anger and your fury according to the fear that is due you, right? There's this, wow, that's not, if you don't get this, you don't understand this great God of his strength and power, Verse 12, you know this verse because you've heard it many times. Lord, teach us to number our days that we may present you 
a heart of wisdom. See, I think this is what David's after as well. You may be troubled with the brevity of life, but when we start to ponder brevity of life and the vanities of life, and we don't get consumed by them, we now want to be consumed by God. What do you have for me? If I own a business, help me be the best business owner for your glory, God. If I'm a husband, a wife, Lord, help me fulfill that role according to your word for your glory. I know there's going to be pain. I know we're going to fail each other. But Lord, may we have short accounts, be quick to forgive one another, quick to love you so we'll love one another. Or you can just let the vanities of life destroy your marriage and your children. See, I think we need this instruction to number our days so that when we do stand before our God and Savior and give an account, we'll speak with a heart of wisdom. Pastors, uh, I mean, it's as plain as can be. We, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17 tells that we will stand before God and give an account with what we did with his flock. I, I have to stand and give an account for all of you. What did I do with you? Did I preach a word or did I preach Scott's word? Did I tickle your ears or did I bring you truth? Did I love you and lead you? But you have it too. You will stand before God with what he's given you. Your sins, there will be no condemnation, right? And those are in Jesus Christ. So you're not judged for your sin. Those are forgiven. But he will say, what you do with what I gave you? I gave you my stuff. You were a tender of it. You were a manager of it. You were a shepherd of the things that I gave you to, to manage what you do with them. Did you bring me glory? Did you multiply those things? Or did you bury it in the sand? What are you going to do with it? It's a new year, brothers and sisters. God is a God of grace. There's mercy every morning, ready to go again. Are you going to give up and roll over? This is what God wants us to do. Young people, I love you. But don't wait any longer. Don't say I'm young. Don't say I'll get going faster than my parents did. You won't. Young people, today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to run. Start now. Outrun your parents. They want you to. I want my children to love Jesus and his word more than I do. I want my grandchildren to do the same. I want their children. In fact, Proverbs, in, in a place in Proverbs, and just I'm coming off the top of my cuff here, really teaches us that to see what our true godliness is often seen in our grandchildren. Did it translate through me to my children to my children's children? They are the crown of a grandparent. Hey, we've got to work at this. Not for salvation, but because God's worthy of it. Older folks, this includes me. I already told you, I'm almost done. <laughs> if you look at the grand scale, right? That's 60, and there's three score and 10. That's your old King name. That's 70, maybe 80. I'm in the final stretch. And I got my head down, and I'm running hard. Are you? Are you ready to finish well? Are you looking to the left and the right and going to try to run through the tape? Or are you hurt and sitting on the side of the race? Paul said, I finished the race. I fought the fight. I kept the faith all past ten. There is a crown of righteousness laid up for me, but not only for me, but for all those who will love the appearing of our God and Savior. Are you going to run? 2024, is it time to get the spiritual tennis shoes on and get running? This is what David wants. This is what he wants. See, life is short, and God has fixed the span of our years. You're not going to change those. Notice in verse 5, you see that explanation about it. Behold, you have made my days a hand breath. Ver end of the verse. Surely every man at his best is a mere breath. Middle of it, my lifetime as nothing in your sight. You just see this as God did this. God has caused man's life to be brief. God put man out of the garden. Do you get that? If he doesn't put them out of the garden and they get to that tree of life, they live in decay, in sin for eternity. He made our lives short, brothers and sisters, so we can die and go and be with him. And if he's gracious enough, we see his return. 
6. The Bible says we're a phantom. It's an interesting word. It's the same word being made in his image in Genesis 1.26. But I think the stronger word there is for nothing. <laughs> well, you think you're something? The Bible just tells you you're nothing. That's a good place to understand. I'm nothing, Lord. Now, that doesn't mean that he doesn't love me and care for me and knew me for the foundations of the world and drew me to himself in all the beauty of God's grace. Oh, don't, don't miss that. But this is written for those who think they're something. I've said this so many times on the pulpit, God loves to use nobodies. Don't be afraid of that. Oh, Scott, I can't preach, I can't do that. Well, wait a minute. You're made in the image of God. He blessed you with salvation. He opened your eyes to the truth of your sin, saved you from a hell that you deserved. You've got to have something to give him. He did not leave you empty-handed. Oh, look at verse 6. Excuse me, that was 6. Phantom, nothing. But notice the end of verse 6. He amasses riches and does, and does not know who will gather them. Oh, that's Jesus, right? Didn't Jesus give a parable about that? Luke chapter 12. And he told this parable. Jesus tells this parable. A, land, a man had rich and was very productive. And he began reasoning in himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said to himself, I, here's what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns. I'll build larger ones. And there I'll store all my grain and all my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, I have many good laid, goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God says to him, you what? Fool. Wow. When God calls somebody a fool, I think we should listen up. This very night, your soul is required of you, and now you will own, who will own what you have prepared? Who's going to get your stuff? So is the man who stores up treasures for himself and is not rich towards God. Look, some of us may not have large bank accounts, but I hope our our treasure is in God. See, David has learned that the human life is no accident and that God, being a good God, has authorized the length of time. He understands that. He knows God is good. And though he's suffering and he's pouring his heart out and burning his heart out to God and, and wanting to be solved in these things, in the end of it, he knows he's a good God. He knows he has ordained every one of his days. And he's putting trust in them. What amount of time has God given you your children are not guaranteed. If you're in your 20s, you're not guaranteed. 50s, 70s, where are you at? See, King Hezekiah, he wanted more life. You remember that in 2 Kings chapter 20, I think somewhere around there. He, he, he's very upset. He cries and complains and turns. I think the Bible says he turns towards the wall and cries to God. God gives him 15 more years. But when you study that, I think I would have taken the way out because <laughs> it got bad towards the end. Be content with the years God has given you. Strive to make them meaningful and profitable for the glory of God and for his people. Start now. It's the last day of the year. Wake up tomorrow and experience his glory. Third thought, God's discipline that drives us into the arms of everlasting hope. Well, this third section introduces another problem that David is experiencing. That's the disciplining hand of God. And you combine this with the brevity of life and the vanity of things. Now this becomes intense. Notice verse 7. Notice the question that he says. And now, Lord, for what do I wait? If I amass, amass these riches, somebody else gets them. I'm just nothing. I'm just a breath. I'm a hand breath. That means a short span of time. If all that, and he finally comes to this, and now, Lord, for what do I wait? It's a great question. In other words, David says, if I, if I cannot have certainty in knowing the numbers of my days of my life, and I also cannot trust my own heart to understand the vanities of this life, what in the world am I waiting for? And then look, he answers his own question. End of verse 7. My hope is in you. I know this is, this is you're going, Scott, could we have done something a little lighter for the last time of the year? <laughs> I don't have much time left, remember? I'm going to keep telling you that. 
We've got to run hard and this is it. Put your hope in the Lord. See, it's the right answer. In fact, I would say this is the only answer. And look, he's not saying this. I turn to you because you're my last hope. I, I think that's what people do. Well, my life is falling apart. Everything's gone. I'm bankrupt. I'm divorced. I don't have anything. Maybe I'll go try that church thing. Look, Jesus isn't your last hope. He's your only hope. I mean, there is nothing else. And you've proved it. You cannot beat this life. This life is going to kill you. And you're either going to put your hope in Jesus or you're going to find yourself going to the grave going, vanity, vanity, all's vanity. I hate life, I'm done. Or you're going to run through the tape. And you're going to say, come get me, Lord. I can't wait to be in your presence. Look at verse 8 with me. Deliver me from all my transgressions. Make me not the reproach of the foolish. Hmm, I love this. See, he, I think he's saying there's no justifications in my good works. They only make me look like a fool. I'm not here to try to justify myself. I need you. My works are sinful at times. They're filthy rags to you. And David is pleading, you're my hope. You're my only hope. And thus he welcomes the loving discipline of the hand of the Lord, but he wants it relieved. And I think that's okay. If you're under the disciplined hand of the Lord, you should cry out for him and ask for mercy and ask him to lift his hand off you. I've been there. I know what you're going through. But that disciplined hand is good for you. Verse 9, I have become mute. I do not open my mouth because it is you who have done this. See, he doesn't attempt to justify himself. Rather, he remains in silent and he says, you're doing this. And so God, you're a good God. I know you're a good God. So I accept what you're doing. Verse 10 and 11, remove your plague from me. I don't know what this guy's going through, but it ain't good, right? It's hard. Because of the opposition of your hand, I am perishing with reproof. You chasten me for iniquity. You consume as a moth what is precious to him. Surely every man is a mere breath. And he can, he can, he can feel the weightiness of God upon him. And he feels as though he's perishing. And listen, brothers and sisters, that is the refining work of the hand of God at times. I talk to some people who claim to be Christians and ask them if they ever felt the heavy hand of the refining work of God. And they say, well, what does that mean? If you're a Christian, your father in heaven is going to shape you into the image of his son. And it hurts sometimes. Because we are not like him. He is ever presently transforming us, continual present tense, into the image of his son, right? 2 Corinthians 3, 18. That's what the Bible tells us. And so we feel that at times. Job felt this. I, for some reason in my Bible reading, I switched it around a little bit, and I read Job twice in December, and, and this really got me. Job, Job chapter 7, he does not know what God's doing, and this is what comes out of him. And I think this is okay as well. So that my soul would choose suffocation. This is what he gets to. <laughs> my soul choose suffocation, death rather than my pains. I waste away. I will not ever, I will not live forever. Leave me alone, for my days are but a breath. There's the same word. What is man that you magnify him, that you are concerned about him, that you examine him every morning and try him every moment? Isn't that interesting how he sees God very involved in his suffering? Will you never turn your gaze away from me nor let me alone until I swallow my spittle? I have sinned. What have I done to you? Excuse me, have I sinned? Question mark. What have I done to you, O watcher of men? Why have you set me as a, target so that I am burdened to myself why then do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity for now I will lie down in the dust and you will seek me but I will not be I remember reading this going whoa he has no idea that he's showing him as a trophy of his grace and in, and in his humanness and you and I would do the same thing and maybe have done the same thing we feel the weightiness of God upon us and he might be showing your testimony to the world. And I think that's what he did with Job. 
And you think about this, there's all kinds of feelings. And when you think about these two righteous men, both David and Job here, they're expressing their understanding of the sovereignty of God. It's not easy. They're going through difficult things, but they know God is in it. And they understand God gives and God takes away and blessed be the name of the Lord. Are you there? God gives, God takes away, blessed be his name. Are you there? If not, ask him to help you get there. Help me, Lord, get to that type of thinking. I see, I think David's speaking of his own sin. Job is speaking of his blamelessness. He's like, Lord, why? I, I, I've done what is right. Yet both are experiencing the heavy hand of God. So that tells us that if we're in sin, our Father loves us and he disciplines the ones he loves, but also he'll use us in our godliness and our reflection of him even at that time to show our dependency upon him. And so often our times of discipline from God are meant to drive us into his arms, was the point here. He wants to drive you into his arms. Hebrews 12, 11, all discipline for a moment seems not to be joyful but sorrowful. Yet those who have been trained by it afterward yield the peaceful fruit of righteousness 2 Corinthians 4, 17, for momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. That's what he's taking us through. It's so important that we understand that we're not merely creatures made for today, brothers and sisters. We are made for transformation into eternity. And God will do whatever it takes to shape us in his son. Last thought here, living to... Live, living, learning to live as strangers and sojourners, but longing for heaven. Here we find David's final petition, I think the climax of his prayer here. David has come a long ways in his thinking, even in these two Psalms. He's wrestled with the brevity of life and the vanities. And notice what he does in verse 12. Hear my prayer, O Lord. Give ear to my cry. Do not be silent at my tears. More than ever now does David want to communicate with his God. See, I think that's why you know you got your trial right. You're not hiding from God or running from God. You want to talk to God. You want to be close to him. And it's not, it's, whatever he's going through doesn't seem to be alleviate, alleviated yet. All he knows is he wants to be in the presence of God. He, does, he wants to hear from God. He wants to be in communication with God. I think that's the result of it. Notice the end of verse 12. Look at this. For I am a stranger with you, a sojourner like all my fathers. Well, David has now come to terms with this immutable God, this unchanging God. See, he knows that his fathers before him, the children of God, were to be strangers and sojourners and even aliens. It's an Old Testament term there. It, speaking of the patriarchs who, um, like he says, like all my fathers, like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, they never owned anything in the land, but were promised the land. I take that back. Abraham uh, bought a plot of lamb from the Hittites to bury Sarah in. He owned a graveyard. <laughs> Jewish law told the Jews that they could not let sojourners, strangers, and aliens own land. They were to treat them kindly, but they were not to own land. What a principle for us. We know this flows in the New Testament. 1 Peter chapter 2, 11 through 12 says, Behold, uh, beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against your soul. This is not our home. He says, Scott, I own a home. That's okay, but this isn't your home. You're going somewhere else. Um, I was, as a young man, I was really affected by an evangelist named Keith Ward. He was, he was probably six six or six eight, but as a young person, he looked like he was nine foot six. He would stand in the pulpit, and his head would be here. And he, he had an amazing life. His first wife was a mean and harsh, very unloving woman, and so he never took a pulpit in a church. He just was an evangelist. She died, and God gave him an, actually an older wife that was older than him, and she cared for his life for, until he died. And, but Keith was an interesting man, and he'd tell people this. He said, I, I don't teach people to hold this. This is my conviction. He says, I will not own a home. I will rent till I die. This is not my home. He spent his life that way. He died in a rented home. He died in a rented chair. His wife walked in, came in from 
preaching on the street, sat down in his chair, says, sweetheart, I'm very tired. She goes, I'll get you a dinner. Just sit there. As she went to fix his dinner and came back, he was dead. Died and all that rented stuff. (laughs) Because he said, I'm an alien and stranger. This is not my home. He lived that way. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13 and 16 teaches this. All these, these are those patriarchs, a hall of faith. All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance and having confessed that they were strangers and exiles on this earth. For those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a country of their own. And indeed, if they had been thinking of that country from which they went out, they would have had the opportunity to return. But as it is, they desired a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Boy, that's a different thinking than the American dream. Right? Verse 13, i got to quit here because we're going to remember the Lord. I think this is a great thing to do here. But look at verse 13. Turn your gaze away from me that I may smile again. Behold, I depart and I am no more. Well, here I think David is asking God to lift this heavy hand of discipline so he can experience joy before he dies. And knowing King David and studying his life, in his pursuit of God, he's, I think he's again desiring to experience the joy of the Lord, much like he said in Psalms 51, return to me the joy of my salvation. He wants to leave this earth joyful. I think this is quite a natural response for believers when we suffer, maybe at the end of our life in pain and suffering. I, I think this was a natural spot. So David probably thought he was gonna die. But there's some time in there where you have to believe the Lord is going to deliver you from your afflictions even in this life or the next. He's going to bring you home. So in that process, we have to get to the place where we say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Now, i got to quit, but I want to give you just some thoughts because we're going in 2024. How do I do this? Let me just give you some thoughts. You might want to write these down. He says, God, how do I do this? I want this. I, I asked the same thing and talked to the Lord all week about this passage. And it just reminds me of things I've taught all my life, taught them to myself, taught to my children, my family, to, to the many people I've pastored. Love the things God loves, hate the things God hates. Boy, if you just start there. Love the things God loves, hate the things God hates. Boy, that'll transform your life. And in that, you'll find that you need to love his word. Love his word. You spend time every day reading his truth. You can read the Wall Street Journal and try to figure out your stocks, but somebody else will get them. You can read the word of God and help you be a good steward of those stocks, how to bring them glory. I love reading through the Bible. I have a couple that I put in here. Um, One of my dear friends, uh, Pastor Kelly, who's teaching DTP, he's got all his guys reading through Blue Letter Bible, and it's a chronological read. I love the five-day reading because I preach on the weekends. <laughs> uh, so I have a five-day reading one. If you just Google and five-day Bible reading program, it'll come up. And I read through the Bible every year. I love it. Uh, some people start and they do it in two years. That's okay. Get in the book. Get in the book. Read it. It has the words of life. Pray. This year I've asked the Lord to help me strengthen my prayer life. I want to pray more. I want to beseech him more i want to be captured by christ that's something you could ask lord lord help me be captured by the glory of your son i want to be like john we beheld his glory (laughs) do you behold his glory i want to be a church that is just captured by jesus and his word and love for one another that's what that's what i think the bible tells us love his people don't hurt them Keep short accounts. When you sin, you're going to sin, friend, sister, brother in Christ. You're going to sin. Keep short accounts. Recognize it as sin. Call it sin. Don't blame shift it and say, oh, God, forgive me for this and name it. Your son had to die for it. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for that. Short accounts. Forgive as you've been forgiven. There's people in here who are not forgiven one another. I don't know about it. I'm praying that God will give you the ability to forgive as you've been forgiven. The Bible says, that if you don't forgive my Father, Jesus says, my Father in heaven won't forgive you. It's a mark of a Christian. We forgive. And forgiving doesn't mean, well, I'm not going to forget. That's not how the Lord forgives. Praise the Lord. Amen. Forgive. 
Let it off your shoulder. Live like Christ. Keep a loose grip on the things of this world. If God gives you much, hold them lightly. Hold them lightly. Some of you say, well, I don't have much to hold. That's okay. That's good. Just hold whatever it gives you. Hold it lightly. Because he may ask for it. Will you give it to him? Father in heaven, we thank you for such a passage as Psalms 39. It really grips our soul. David is thinking he's possibly going to die, and so he comes to grip with his tongue and his mouth and his thoughts and what he thinks about life, and he pours it out in the psalm, Lord, and as we break it down and look at it and think through it, Lord, we begin to realize, oh, Lord, I can be really gripped by the things of this world that have no eternal value. 2024 is just hours away. It's another year of life that you may grant us, Lord. But we're not assured we're even going to see it. You could take any one of us home in just a moment's notice. We don't deserve that kind of grace, but you watch over us and you know our breaths and you know our days have been ordained. We cannot add to them or take away from them. So, Lord, we want to live them well. Whatever it is, if it's another day, if it's another 10 years, whatever it may be, we want to live them well. Father, I pray for the young people in this room that they will not wait to live for Jesus. There's nothing but danger there. Raise up young people in this church, Lord, in this ministry who are white hot for Jesus Christ and his word. We need them, Lord. We need that next generation now. Lord, those of us a little older, God, help us lean forward and run hard through the tape. Let us not be weighed down and bogged down by the sins of this world that ensnare us. Let us run well, Lord, for your glory. Lord, we thank you. We're undeserving of what you've done for us. May we show you in a life dedicated to you, not for any gain, but because we love you, that we'll run for you. In Jesus' name, amen. I couldn't think of anything better to do than have the Lord's table on the last day of the year because I think this, if you'll just take a minute and I'm going to get this into your hands real quickly and Hayward and the team are going to lead us in a song while they're passing it out. I want you to think about what we just heard in Psalms 39 in relationship to his death, burial, and resurrection for us. If you don't do that, all of that sermon will just go away. This is a motivation to live for what we just talked about. Amen? Father, help us now as we take this and we sing and we ponder and meditate these truths. May the death, burial, and resurrection of your son motivate us and cause us to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen.
your hand you hold a cup that has bread in the bottom and juice in the top in just a moment you'll pull that top one out and, and then take the bread but I couldn't help but think as I thought about this message and then communion and Lord's table together I thought Jesus lived a very abbreviated life 33 years we would call that very short today wouldn't we but he accomplished everything he needed to secure our eternity. And so his brevity of life was to help us live in light of our brevity of life. He's paid for your sins. There's no condemnation to those who are in Jesus Christ. So you're free from your sin, all of the payment that would come with that. He's taken that away. He satisfied the Father who propitiated his wrath. Now he wants to li- want you to live for him. Glorify him in all that you do, your marriage, your home, your job, your finances. Just go down the list. Glorify the Lord because it's just a short life. So our Lord lived a very short life. And he lived it in the flesh. He was human. We just got done celebrating during the month of December the incarnation of Christ. Him stepping out of heaven. Veiling himself in flesh. So he could live that perfect life and be the perfect sacrifice, be our representative and die for us. So you and I can live for him even in this short life. So let's pray and thank him for that and then we'll take the bread. Lord, we thank you that you are the ultimate example of how to live a short life for you. You're the God of eternity. You're you're our creator. You're the God of glory. You came and dwelt among your creation. 33 years of perfection so that you could be the final lamb. Lord, that should encourage us and motivate us and strengthen us to live for 2024 and 2024 for you. Whether that's one day or 365, Lord, let that motivate us. Thank you, Jesus, for taking on flesh being pierced for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Take the bread in remembrance of his death. Jesus was truly flesh and blood, and when they pierced him, he bled. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no more remission of sin. So he had to be man, right? He he couldn't be some spirit that just dwelt among us of many liberal people believe. He had to be like you and I. And that's why we love him so much, don't we? When they pierced him, he bled. And Hebrews chapter 9 really gives us the word picture of him carrying his blood into the Holy of Holies before the Father and satisfying the Father's wrath so that Christians could say there is no condemnation to those who are in Jesus. I think that's pretty good motivation to live for him, isn't it? It's a great story here on Sunday school, but what about Monday school? What's it going to be like tomorrow for you? I know most of us are holiday and we'll be rooting for some teams. God's so good to us, isn't he? But will you live for him? Will you be willing to die for him? Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came and were pierced for our transgressions. Father, you crushed him for our iniquities. But you were satisfied with him. We can now do nothing to get your love, Lord. It was all done because of your son. You even grant us faith to believe and repent. And so, Lord, we hold you in highest esteem. Loosen our tongues, Lord, to bring you praise, even in difficulty. Good times and difficult, can we say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Help us get there, Lord. Help us trust you. Help us believe your word. Read it, pray it, study it, live it. So we can say, blessed be the name of the Lord in the difficult and the good. I pray for Riverbend Church, Lord. You will strengthen us in 2024. If you need to whittle us down, do it, Lord. Do whatever it takes to make us a ministry, a church that resembles your son. 
Help us live for you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Take drink in remembrance of Christ's blood. On behalf of the elders, I want to wish you a happy new year and that you'll run and live for him. You are dismissed. Happy new year.